So, Joseph Pierce, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Uh, we are going to be discussing the life and work of Hilaire Belloc, primarily from your, your book, Old Thunder, uh, which is uh, the Old Thunder, A Life of Hilaire Belloc, Old Thunder being the nickname he, he gained. Um, and to be honest, you don't even need to know that much about him. You could just look at a, at a picture of him and probably understand why he's called Old Thunder. Um, so, and this is a really great introduction to Belloc, really great. Uh, you know, and a really great read. Many, most people, if they've heard of Belloc, would have under, will know of him through through his work either with Chesterton or through uh, distributism. Um, but hopefully, we'll delve into many more aspects of of, of his work. So, um, yeah, Joseph, thanks very much for coming on. And as it is with this podcast, uh, I start with the Hermetics question. Uh, you can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room. Listen in on the conversation, and Hilaire Belloc is already there. So we've already got some some dynamite in the room, and add three more. Who do you pick? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I would say I would have to say Chesterton because I, if you got Belloc, you want Chesterton there, so you can have the full Chester Belloc experience. <laughs> uh, I probably would love to have William Shakespeare in the room at the same time. Uh, and then perhaps uh, Sir Robert Southall, the Jesuit martyr, who almost certainly knew um, uh, Shakespeare. Um, uh, so, and it was a, was a, a poet in his own right. So we have four literary men that are also uh, Catholics, uh, and I think, and that, I think that would be um, that would be a very, yeah, I don't know, five is my word, a flame, a mm. flame conversation. Do you, do you think it would end in perhaps potential disagreements or do you think it would be a sort of a, a, a bolstering of the Catholic faith in that in that room? Well, I think what would happen would be what 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 Chesterton said of his relationship with his brother. He said we were uh, always arguing, but we never quarreled. Uh, I, in other words, I think if you have four uh, minds that are as alive as, as these four men and as creative uh, as spirits, as these four men are, um, I think that you're bound to have disagreements. Uh, I, you know, even if it's like, even if it's on ma- matters of art, or it, it wouldn't be, on, it wouldn't be on matters of fundamentals as regards the truths of the Catholic faith, because all four men would have accepted that. But, um, but certainly, that within within those those should we say defined parameters, there's all sorts of room to uh, to disagree about things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is there any specific thing that you, you you think you would like like them to to broach a topic that you think they might head into that you'd love to hear specifically? Well, uh, you know, I, I I would love if if I were if, if I were in the room was allowed to join the conversation <laughs> rather yeah. than be you fly on the wall, um, <laughs> which would be great in itself, of course. Um, uh, I would I would like to explore more uh, about how the relationship between Shakespeare and St. Robert Southall, because obviously that whole period of history, the late Elizabethan uh, uh, period, they're, they're, these people aren't even paper trails as regards their Catholic faith, because it's deadly to do so. It's like being in the Soviet Union. So consequently, for historians that try to sort of uh, uncover the mysteries of that time, it can be somewhat frustrating because, you know, all of these circumstantial evidence suggests that they would have known each other, but there's very little uh, documentary evidence to sustain or support that. So it would be great if I were there to hear it from the uh, the horse's mouth, so to speak. Mm, okay. Yeah. I think that's a good, that's a good use in a way of figuring some things out. Well, I'm sure probably all of these figures, definitely Chesterton is going to come back in. Uh, but moving into Old Thunder himself, Hilaire Belloc, really the beginning of this book is completely in keeping with, with how, as, as, as one would probably imagine it with Belloc. He is born into a pretty explosive, hostile world. So this man who's known for his temperament of being quite a bombast along with Chesterton, he's really born into a, a world which which... I don't think entirely sculpts his personality. I think that was definitely there anyway, but I think the world really played a big, big part. So he, yeah. So he's born into a hostile world. Yeah. I I think, I think the, uh, it it would be true to say that for Bella more than almost more than anybody else I can think of at the moment, and more more than almost any one period was actually shaped by the first few moments of his birth. (laughs) Uh, in in the sense that, you know, he was born, uh, just a few, uh, 
uh, months before the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War in 1870. At that time, he was living, uh, his father was French, his mother was English, and they were living uh, just outside Paris. So with the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War, the, the family had to evacuate uh, their home. And Belloc, uh, as, as a baby, six-month-old baby, uh, escaped with his parents on the last um, on the last train le heading north out of Paris towards Calais, uh, seeking refuge in, in, in England as refugees. Um, and if he hadn't bought that, if they hadn't bought that train, he almost certainly would have died because uh, almost every child under the age of 12 months died during the siege of Paris, which followed. So, you know, Belloc carries with him this knowledge, even though, of course, he couldn't remember uh, the event because he was too young, he carries with him the knowledge and it shapes his thought. And for instance, he's very much a Francophile, for better or worse, and it colours his work uh, uh, and it colours his philosophy in both good and bad ways. Uh, and, but as well as being a Francophile, he's, he's, he's somewhat of a Prussophobe. Uh, he, he doesn't like Prussia and the Germans in general. <laughs> uh, and again, that also colours his work for better or worse. So you need to, we need to know that if we're going to sort of understand Belloc. Mm -hmm. Where do you, where do you think that that really comes from? That that uh, you know that French heritage of his, which isn't really it, it, they, people people state you know throughout throughout your biography, you, you you mentioned that people state that it's clear in his personality, but he he almost. He, of course, is a Francophile, as you say, but almost at times it appears he can't quite make the full leap and he isn't fully accepted in either camp, in a certain sense. Well, I think that's true. I, I, I think he finds himself uh, uh, at home in both and at home in neither, and therefore an exile in both, an exile in neither. So he's not, he never feels fully English. He feels fully Sussex. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and one thing I love about him is he has this theology of place, very much a localist in a not just a sort of political or economic sense, but in a philosophical sense, this theology of place, uh, which, which, which in, uh, uh, animates his, his thinking. So he's very much a man of Sussex, but he's not an Englishman. Uh, he feels himself to be a Frenchman, but he's aware he's an outsider because, you know, that uh, although he speaks French fluently, English is his first language. Um, and uh, he was raised in England and except for serving in the French army, uh, and many visits to France. He ne never lived there. So he, 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 it's almost, you know, that somebody is, you know, it, you get over here in the States, there are certain you know, Irish Americans who sort of are more Irish than the Irish, but they're not Irish at all. Really, they're in, in, the, in the intrinsic sense, they're Americans mm -hmm. with an Irish heritage. And it doesn't matter how much you feel yourself to be Irish. If you're raised in the United States, you're an American uh, with an Irish heritage. You're not Irish. And I think that was, that's Belloc. He's an he's an, anyway, he's a man of Sussex, <laughs> uh, but he's not he's not fully French as, as much as he might desire to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you, how do you think that colours his work? You know, is is there something? Yeah, is there something within that where you know his work almost has to he has to almost develop an allegiance in his work to the, to these ideas? You know, it's not quintessentially English work, so to speak. Yeah, no, it's certainly, I mean, certainly he's a European uh, uh, because he straddles both both sides of the channel. And I think that's that's healthy. It's certainly, it was certainly healthy on, on Chesterton because it allowed Chesterton to see Europe and not merely uh, England and to see Europe through European eyes, and not merely through English eyes. So I think that Belloc's European perspective actually broadened Chesterton's historical uh, and cultural perspective, which was a good thing. I think that the bad thing about it is that, you know, it's a bit like over here uh, in the States. Uh, to be American, you have to be loyal to the Constitution. You have to be loyal to the revolution, uh, to the republic. Uh, and I think that Belloc felt exactly the same about France, that in order to be a true Frenchman, he had to be loyal to the revolution and loyal to the republic. And that certainly meant that it's in his early works, particularly, he sort of softened and got a bit more sensibly, in my judgment, as he got older. But in his early works, there's this almost romantic uh, support for, for, the, for the French Revolution, which was, of course, rapidly anti-Christian, uh, genocidal as regards the Vendée region and the putting down of the Catholic peasants there, um, and very secularist. Um, so uh, uh, very modernist. I mean, everything which Belloc wasn't. <laughs> and yet somehow or other, he, he tried to, to, to square the circle 
uh, to make the square peg fit the round hole uh, by sort of, I'm, I'm a true Frenchman and I can be loyal to the Republic, uh, even though the Republican principles are anathema to his Catholicism. So there was that contradiction, I think, and, 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 and that, that infected Chesterton. Chesterton caught, if you like, uh, this contagious disease of, um, of, of, of sympathising with the French Revolution in some sort of naive, shallow, romantic way. And I think that's the biggest flaw, the Achilles heel in both, in both of their, their works and their perspectives. Mm. That's, in, that's interesting. I mean, you know, that is a big surprise that he doesn't fall on the reactionary side. It, it, is there any, any comment or any, uh, I'm probably assuming there is, considering the absolute extent of his writing, but is there any comment, you know, if we take the two pillars, in a sense, of the, the theory of the revolution now, as, you know, Edmund Burke and, uh, what's the book called? I've completely for, slipped my mind. Edmund Burke on one side anyway, and then someone such as Joseph de Mest on the other side, this reactionary divine right Christian. You know, where, what, would, what would Belloc sort of say of these two figures? Edmund Burke was also opposed to the revolution, of course. I think the book was just called the French Revolution, if I if I, if I recall correctly. But he, you know, he had a very English, restrained, almost utilitarian, in, not in a philosophical sense, in a pragmatic sense, uh, approach to the French Revolution. That basically its evils uh, outweighed any any of its virtues. That was, I think. Burke's position ultimately I and mean, I could be wrong there's a Burkean out there <laughs> and indeed if you're Burkean please feel free to correct me um uh so, but Belloc uh, I think as he his later works where he touches upon France he shows more sympathy for the uh for the monarchy and the aristocracy than he does in the in the early early works and he's more critical of the revolutionaries so I think that he comes of age I think it's the young Belloc who serves in the French army and in his in his early works that sort of sees the revolution through rose-coloured spectacles rather than blood-coloured spectacles, should we say. Mm. Do any of these allegiances ever dampen? You know, is he, is he sort of a, a Francophile in his heart till his dying day? Oh, yeah. He, he, <laughs> he absolutely remains, he remains, he remains a Francophile. He would probably just call himself a Frenchman, uh, a Frenchman and a man of Sussex. He would never, ever have called himself an Englishman. Um, so, uh, no, he, his love of France uh, never diminished. I think his understanding what it was to be French uh, may have evolved as he got older. And he, I think, grew into the fullness of what it is to be French, which is not something confined by or, confined by or constrained by uh, um, the French Revolution. I mean, France is bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, speaking of this idea of something not, you know, not dampening for Belloc, he is sort of a man of quite, you know, he, He's he's either strong one way or he's strong the other. It seems he's very rarely a, a man of, you know, it's black or white. He's not he's not in sort of a grey loose camp of not deciding things. And this was one of the very almost in a way in a biographical sense somewhat somewhat strange actually when when Belloc is understood as a Catholic figure, and when you often read the biographies of of prominent Catholic figures or uh, you know, people of the church, we say in, in a in a wider expanse, you often find in their early life section. Uh, a time of scepticism, time of doubt, and this is why they're remembered, is because they're someone who's overcome doubt. And yet, <laughs> with Belloc, I don't get the smallest hint at any point, even when he was very young, of any sort of, you know, stereotypical adolescent, oh, and then he had this two or three years where he doubted God or denied it, or any, and not even any sense of scepticism writ large. Yeah, well, certainly I would agree with everything you've just said, except for... Uh... And even then, you, 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 I wouldn't disagree with you uh, because you, you, you qualified scepticism with writ large. Um, I think that's important. Of course, Belloc, unlike virtually all the other um, people of whom I've written biographies and, and uh, major figures of the Catholic cultural revival uh, in, in England, are converts. So he's mm -hmm. unusual, first of all, in being a cradle Catholic. Um, uh, so that does make him a little bit different from many of the converts. We can't we can't read his conversion story because there isn't one. Uh, and it, as you say, he doesn't lapse and come back again. So there's not. I, I always say that everybody the one degree of another is a convert because at some point, if you're a cradle Catholic, you have to make it your own. You can't just sort of go through as a naive three year old, you know, for the whole year. Like at some point, you know, you got to grow up and see does this fit um, my my adult perspective. Um, but Belloc, actually, in some sense, I, th I think there are there are passages in Belloc, which I, don't ask me to quote from memory because I can't, uh, where he 
says that on a natural level, he's very skeptical. Um, and, uh, you know, that he, 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 he's not moved like, like people, like even Chesterton or Gerard Manny Hopkins to these flights of spiritual ecstasy. He's very much a man that's rooted and grounded in, in physical things. Uh, he's almost as if he accepts and embraces the spiritual purely on grounds of reason uh, and dogma. Um, and obviously, you know, he's very good at, at not uh, at not believing in any dogma that can't be justified by reason. Uh, he's very much a fetus at ratio Catholic, um, but he's not someone who's who's who. He's not someone who's comfortable uh, in the mystical, spiritual sphere. Although on saying that, for me, the path to Rome, uh, which is, I think, probably his masterpiece from a literary perspective, because of course Belloc you know, writes history and politics and economics, so he's, he, he's, he can't pigeonhole him. But as a literary figure, I think the, the path to Rome is his masterpiece. And there are, there are many aspects of, of that, that journey to Rome both in, it, both in what it was as a fact, as an historical thing that Belloc did, but also the way that it becomes a work of literature with the use of metaphor uh, to, to, um, to, to take the thing beyond the physical sphere towards the spiritual. Uh, there, there, there are, there are, that's a great spiritual work. Uh, and one of these days, I've written on it, but one of these days I'd like to write much more on it so I can go deeper into those aspects. I've taught the path to Rome quite a few times, and, and it, it, there are there are lots of very very deep spiritual insights there that are told with poetic beauty. So he's capable of it, and I think maybe he protested too loudly when he calls himself a skeptic. But um, but on the other hand, generally speaking, he's very much uh, you know a, a down to earth, grounded, ratio logos Catholic, and not a you know a, a mystical Saint John of the Cross figure. Mm. I mean that that does you you've drawn in you've drawn in a lot of ideas there with regards to his own views on things and I'm glad you you mentioned earlier about the idea of almost every catholic being a convert because they have to make it their own and in this sense I mean this is a huge question because it's very it's very and very important I think for Belloc in this sense and and it and it it's really where we see a, a lot of secondary writing about Belloc is with regards to sort of what we could say is Belloc's own Catholicism or like a Belocian Catholicism because there's something about it which is almost potent which is like even people who are Catholics who are Christians even they are sometimes like this is you know they say it's divisive so how would you define Belloc's Catholicism? Well I, I, I would query a question not necessarily outright deny uh, that it's divisive uh, mm. Certainly in my case, Belloc and Chesterton were the two most powerful figures probably in attracting me to the church. Um, you know, in a time of doubt and nominalism, uh, relativism, uh, the, someone who stands up robustly and in a masculine fashion for religion, uh, if he can back what he's saying up with, with rational argument, uh, is actually very persuasive rather than divisive. Now, of course, the, the trouble is someone who is a, as robust as Belloc is going to offend uh, certainly people that don't agree with him. And I think one of the big differences between Belloc and Chesterton is Chesterton was always arguing without ever quarrelling. Belloc very often allowed an, an argument to become a quarrel. Now, I sometimes put the word you know, Belochian and bellicose together, you know, Belochian bellicosity, um, not only because it sounds good, but it's true. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, I think that is, I think it is true. For instance, this, this is the perfect way of, of, of explaining this, is that, you know, H.G. Wells wrote his famous book, The Outline of History, which was basically a, a philosophically materialistic understanding of, of, of human history. Belloc wrote a response to that. Um, uh, called uh, a companion to uh, H.G. Wells's outline of history. Uh, Belloc, uh, Wells wrote a response to, to Belloc's <laughs> response called Mr. Belloc Objects. And then Belloc wrote a response to, Belloc, to, to Wells's response to his response called Mr. Belloc Still Objects. Hmm. And I think Belloc, Belloc claimed to have written over 100,000 words in refutation of, of Wells's thesis and his, his outline of history. 
But the two men became enemies and they were actually members of the same club, a liberal club in London. And when they saw each other, they refused to talk to each other. I mean, it, of course, for Wells, if Wells is not a believing Christian, for him, big deal. But for, for, but for Belloc, mindful of the commandments to love thine enemy, it is, it's more of a problem. Uh, whereas then what, what does Chesterton do? Chesterton writes his book, The Everlasting Man, which is his own response to Wells' uh, uh, outline of history, uh, which only mentions Wells, I think, twice. Uh, never in a, in a confrontational way, uh, but just gives an, an alternative way of understanding history. Uh, you know, basically the, the, the presence of Christ making all the difference, basically. Um, uh, and uh, Wells and Chesterton remain friends. And in fact, Wells even says that if I get to heaven, it will be because of the prayers of my friend G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> so here you have you know, both Be Belloc and Chesterton arguing with the same man one remains friends with him, the other becomes enemies with him. So I agree with you that Belloc can be seen as being divisive in the sense that he can turn an argument into a quarrel and quarrels are divisive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, it, and I think you, you do make it clear in the book that really Belloc did sort of influence Chesterton, but that didn't really happen the other way around. Well, actually, no, I, I think what I, I can't remember what I say in, this, in the book, but I think I say this, but I certainly said it elsewhere. That's only partly true. Uh, that okay. Belloc was... A, Belloc was very influential on, on, on bringing Chesterton, uh, helping Chesterton see things more clearly. So certainly in terms of European history, European culture, uh, in uh, his understanding of English history, uh, the Reformation, um, his understanding of Catholicism, uh, all of this Chesterton got from Belloc and it, and, it, and it helped Chesterton become who Chesterton became. But I think as their friendship developed, I think that Belloc became very dependent upon, if you like, the love that he that, that he had for Chesterton and that Chesterton had for him. Uh, and um, and I think that that Chesterton, for want of a better word, sanctity, uh, uh, rubbed off on Belloc. And I think that Belloc um, saw that, that Chesterton was actually being more successful at being a Christian in terms of practice than, than Belloc himself was. Do you think, uh, if you agree with this, do you think that's why Chesterton is, is uh, more commonly remembered? You know, he's, he's seem, he seems to be, I mean, this is, this is anecdotal really, but Chesterton seems to be far more well known than, than Belloc, who is really only someone you'd really come across if you, you delved somewhat deep into Catholic literature. Do you think it's that, it's that love of Chesterton over the, the bombastic nature of Belloc? Yeah, I think that that's largely correct, and I, and I, I would uh, merely uh, suggest that uh, the one reason the the, the Belloc, Belloc was never as big as Chesterton, but probably when they were contemporaries alive, living contemporaries, they were more shoulder to shoulder, um, and then both of them up to a point uh, in the nineteen sixties when you know. Faith and reason and robust Catholicism was uh, out of fashion for a while. Uh, they, they were both neglected. And then there was a Chesterton revival, which really sort of kicks off in the 80s and has, has, has been continuing. And one thing that's happened, I think, in consequence, is there's a Belloc revival that's following in its train. Because as people come to know Chesterton, they also come to know Belloc. Um, and they want to know Belloc because, I mean, as you, I'm sure you know, in Chesterton's book, uh, his autobiography, there's a whole chapter called Portrait of a Friend dedicated to his friendship with Belloc. So it's a bit like many, many Protestants who love C.S. Lewis come to love Chesterton because they know Lewis loves Chesterton. And I think many Chestertonians that, that come to love Chesterton come to love Belloc because of Chesterton's love for Belloc and indeed Belloc's love for Chesterton. Mm. But I, I think it's a bit unjust. I think as a poet, I wrote something about Chesterton versus Belloc or something and their relative merits. And I think as a poet, Belloc is a better, a better poet than, than, um, than Chesterton. Of course, as an historian, there's no comparison. As an essayist, he's, he's, they're different in style, but they are, I would call them equals. They're both brilliant essayists. So I, I think it's only when we talk about um, novels, Chesterton's novels are much more entertaining and better than Belloc's. There's so much stuff like Belloc's novel so much stolid and stodgy but um and of course that might be my that might be my problem uh that um so in other words i think that it, it, that he deserves to come out of Chesterton's shadow whether whether he ever will 
uh, remains to be seen, but he deserves to certainly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, just jumping jumping back to something you know you were mentioning the fact that he wrote a hundred thousand words in response to H. D. Wells, a very a very practical right. Well, this is what we've got here and now. I'm going to take you to court over this in a certain sense. You you say, uh, and I really like this. You say on page uh, ninety seven, you say that Belloc not only professed a faith, he practiced it, and this is quite strange, really, in a way, because you say, you know, he's not St. John of the Cross. He's not, he hasn't, or Thomas Merton. He hasn't got the, the, the vertical persona of a very mystical, spiritual person in that sense. But in another sense, it's clear that he does have his own form of ca Catholic practice. And do, do you think this is what he would consider Catholic practice, is to really put your flag down and say, no, I'm, I'm here to defend what I, I believe in, in a reasonable, rational way. That is what Catholic practice is for him. I think he, he, he understood something which we all must understand is that the Catholic Church uh, in time and space uh, is the church militant. That's the church of war, that, 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 that those prior to death, Christians could be milis Christi, soldiers of Christ. Um, and so he had this, if you like, almost militant, not almost, <laughs> he had this militant and uh, almost militaristic understanding of, of his having to actually fight in the ranks of the soldiers of Christ against the enemies of Christ. Uh, and this is a battleground. It's um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said that the battle between good and evil, the civil war between good and evil takes place in each individual human heart. So you know, that Belloc understood that absolutely, that this war was not so much a war against non-believers, against the infidel, it was a war against the homo superbus, the proud man within ourselves. Um, but it is a war. And, and you know, that's why you take other Catholic words like Tolkien, we're talking about life being a quest and that we have to slay dragons, right? Metaphorical dragon, evil being dragon. We're going to meet dragons. And if we don't have the courage to, 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 to fight them, we'll be slain. So Belloc had that understanding. And, uh, and I think that's a correct understanding. And I think it's a healthy understanding. Now, the, ch the, the, the church in its fullness, the largest part of the church is in the presence of Christ in eternity. That's the church triumphant. That's what we're all, if you like, fighting for. But we're fighting for it because we that's the only way of actually getting to the church triumphant is to win the victory. To win the victory means being a soldier for Christ in the church militant. Belloc understood that and he lived it. And in that sense, he absolutely practiced what he preached. Mm. And do you think really that that practicing was the foundation for 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 his politics, you know, for what developed into his politics was it had to begin from we need to develop something which can, you know, allow a greater practice on a social level of what it is, you know, we believe in. Yeah, uh, but, you know, you have to understand he's rooted in history. He's rooted in theology. He's rooted in philosophy. So his political philosophy is very much something which is rooted, not something which is uh sort of plucked from from the air or some from some emotion so for instance he understood that uh, that england uh prior to the reformation uh actually that the the it was moving towards a property owning society it was already mm -hmm. a property owning society but 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 serfs were becoming freemen uh that that uh, that every that you know, is getting to the stage where they facto, if not de jure, uh, so in other words, that that, that labourers could, would could live in the same property. And although technically they didn't own it, there was the, the law of entail, the usufruct, uh, which they can actually they had the right to pass it on to their descendants. Mm -hmm. So it was not de facto theirs. This wasn't de jure theirs, but it was de facto theirs. And then the Reformation happens where Henry the Eighth. Uh, enlists the uh, the the assistance of of the avaricious plutocracy to basically strip the church of all of its property and hand it to the plutocracy. Um, so all of a sudden we have we have an absolute from this property owning what would have emerged into a, a genuine democracy where people have power to uh, to to this uh, this elitist plutocracy of 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 uh, of, of uh, ultimately muggers <laughs> hmm. because they bug the church off a property and we know where wh who what was the social fabric of of of, of the economy uh, at the time well you know the churches provided the schools so the monasteries mostly actually provided the schools the hospitals uh help for the poor so that the, the whole welfare system was actually provided by by by, by the church in general and the monasteries in particular that was swept away 
um, and uh, th th then you have then you have uh, uh, um, uh, a society of proletarians. Uh, that what follows on from that is that the the, the, the new landowners who are squatting on the, the church land that they've stolen then start enclosing the common land. And you know, it, the common land was essential for the ordinary people living in the countryside to um, to survive because they didn't have land, but there was common land they could they they, they could graze their their animals on their livestock on. They could survive once the once the Lord of the Manor encloses that for his own personal park. People have nowhere have anywhere to sustain this. And I know you said you live in Norfolk. You know the Kets Rebellion was basically largely, there are many rebellions in the 16th century in defense of the church. Kess Rebellion, that was an aspect of it, but it was mostly against the enclosures of the common land. So Bellot knows all this. He writes about it in his book, The Servile State. He, so economic history as being the foundation for an economic philosophy. Um, and and then and then it, you know, he understands that the, the Catholic Church is teaching, Rerum Navarum, but Pope Leo XIII's uh, encyclical and so he puts these two together that, that the way the way to attain political and economic freedom is through property through private property that there's many people as possible need to own productive property um and, and that's the opposite of both capitalism and again we define our terms more but i'm not going to go off on a tangent mm. moment if you want to come back if you can capitalism where basically property becomes concentrated in fewer and fewer mm -hmm. people uh, or socialism, where property is abolished and put in the hands of politicians. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we've seen that in practice in, in China, in the Soviet Union and the other communist countries, and it, 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 it turns out to be tyrannical. So Belloc's, for want of a better word, third way, or what he called distributism, it's an ugly word, um, uh, that, that is rooted in, in economic history, in, in, in political philosophy, uh, as well as Catholic theology. So Belloc is someone who knows what he's talking about. Hmm. Just out of interest, I mean, what um, you say, you know, he's rooted in theology. I mean, is, is he, you know, is he a Thomist or is it, does he find his allegiance sort of elsewhere? Insofar as he um, uh, writes philosophically, he's a Thomist. Hmm. But, um, but uh, he doesn't usually write philosophically. <laughs> so, so, so the point is that, 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 that his philosophy is subsumed within his Catholicism, but it's an authentic, i.e. orthodox Catholicism, and authentic, i.e. orthodox Catholicism is, philosophically speaking, to mystic. Mm, okay, okay. I'm sure there'll be people listening who might disagree with that, but there we go. We'll see. We'll see I'm, sure right. will. I'm sure they will. <laughs> Vive la différence. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, you 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 make uh, distributism sound very very simple in that sense, in a very in a very nice way. You know, it's often the case these days that the you know people make people are on the with right leaning bias or conservative bias make it clear that the that, uh, that within the catechism of the Catholic Church that it it makes it explicit that you cannot be a communist and a Catholic, but at the same time they often occlude. The fact that it also lists, you know, fascist, fascist, and I believe capitalism is in there, though. Don't quote me on that, but I believe it is that you, you, you know, and they, that's often it's often made made as if it's only communism, and so that's, you know, that's often overlooked in in, in the fact of this. But one thing I guess I want to ask with distributism is that in a on a on a uh, on a specifically Christian level, what does the the, the distribution of private profits to, to all these individuals? What how does that let's say benefit the individual on a Christian level? Well, it's rooted in the dignity of the human person. So uh, uh, the, the, the human person needs to have uh, authentic freedom in terms of the way that he lives his life politically and economically. Um, if a, a proletarian who owns no property has no freedom. Uh, and similarly, a, a, if someone could be a proletarian for under a socialist regime because private property has been abolished, or they could be a proletarian under a capitalist regime because the majority of productive property is in the hands of, of, of a relatively few people. So uh, the dignity of the human person requires that authentic economic and political freedom. And for the Catholic, of course, the basic political unit is not the individual, but the family. Mm. Uh, the, 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 the family needs to be able to exert its freedom from the state uh, or from 
other entities that 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 that, that, that could damage it. And again, how do you best uh, ensure that the family is free from such interference? The, ensuring that it, it actually owns the home, uh, and it also has uh, some some real control over the capital that it needs to sustain itself. So, you know, ultimately it's rooted philosophically in the dignity of the human person. Mm. Do, you, do you think he, um, do you think Belloc goes, goes takes, a, takes a foot wrong at any point with distributism? Do you have any criticisms of it where you think now perhaps over time there might have, things might have changed in such a way you think, well, actually now that needs to be changed in a certain way? Or do you think, I mean, I guess in one sense, I'm also asking, are you a distributist? <laughs> I, I am a distributist, uh, uh, absolutely, and I think that the principles are timeless, mm -hmm. um, and they can be found in the church's understanding of subsidiarity and solidarity, for instance, which are terms that you see in the Catechism, but also in Leo XIII of Aaron the Barham and Pius XI's Protestant Anno and St. John Paul II's Centesimus Annus, etc. So this is something which is part of the living tradition of the church's political philosophy. Um, but uh, the only thing I would say with Belloc, um, so the principles are, are timeless. So no, uh, there's nothing in those principles uh, that are problematic. What Belloc was doing most of the time, how, and this has caused problems, and I've had discussions and debates and arguments with people over here, particularly free market libertarians, <laughs> because Belloc's language sounds to them socialistic. And uh, what, what they need to realize is that Belloc is in dialogue with socialism. Right. So in other words, he's trying to convert the socialists. So, yes, he's he's seeking common ground. He's they, they're talking about common terms mm. uh, and common mm. problems that they can both agree is a, is an issue and a problem. But that's so in other words, we have to understand who is he talking to? Who's his audience? Of course, he's trying to sound attractive to socialists because he's trying to convert them from socialism. <laughs> um, you know, um, but but yeah, the, what they what some of these you know with a distance of a hundred years, um, uh, are, are just, all they're seeing is the, the, the what they see is quasi socialist rhetoric. Well, it it is, but only in order to actually convert the socialists from socialism towards to distributism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So probably somewhat maybe not a tough question. In what sense isn't it socialistic? In the sense of, you know, is it simply the fact of just giving out property or was, was there another system in place where it was based on other things, you know? Because that seems yeah, to be the socialist element, right? Where you're just, you're saying, right, we take this and then we give it out. Well, no, that, I don't think the Belloc's ever, ever said that. And I don't <laughs> think any distributors ever says that. That The, the, the Belloc uh, and distributors are very um, sceptical and suspicious of the power of the state. Mm. Uh, and I think that most distributors, the reason they're distributors is because they believe in Lord Acton's, Acton's maxim that power tends to corrupt and absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. Um, so, no, what distributors believe it is that we should be moving towards uh, any, 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 any movement towards more widespread property ownership is a healthy development. Any movement away where fewer people are owning private property is an unhealthy development. So uh, most most distributors are, are, I would say, evolutionary distributors, not revolutionary distributors. Mm, okay. uh, basically, you know, it's what, uh, for instance, give, give practical distributism on a daily basis. It's like living a, a practical Christian life. My wife, uh, we as a family, buy almost all our meat from the local Carolina Growers Group. It's a small store owned by local farmers. We buy, try to buy source as much of our local vegetables locally i drink local craft ale not not mass-produced global um stuff <laughs> yeah. yeah so um we try we try to we, we try to be part of the local culture attend local theaters um we, we we disconnect as far as we possibly can from the whole globalist network um as much as it's possible right you can't be you can't live in a dream world you have to live in the real world but you can be making the world what i say is that, that to be a, a practical distributor is to realize that every dollar you have in your pocket, every pound, uh, is a vote. And, and, and so I think you're either voting with every pound or dollar you spend for a better world or a worse world. So that for me, practical distributism is changing the world one pound or one dollar at a time. Okay, yeah.
That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, there is there's there's one other sort of uh position of Bellox, and it was probably my favorite part of the book because I just found it so unique and somewhat funny. So we've already, you know, we've upset the capitalists, we've upset the socialists with H.G. Wells, we've upset the materialists, so we might as well upset the suffragettes as well. So, and Belloc's opposition to uh, female suffrage, you know, big big thing in Belloc's day, of course. Um, just, I found it so unique that I, I feel we have to bring it in. So, you know, what is Belloc's oppo- oppos- oppositional stance to female suffrage? Well, Belloc and Chesterton were both against against uh, uh, female suffrage, and and the reason was that they thought Belloc, uh, that uh, the politics is a dirty, horrible business, uh, and it's 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 like it's like putting up putting up the rubbish. I was almost said putting up the trash. I was not speaking American over there for so long. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm the one who takes the rubbish to the dump every week because I wouldn't let my wife do it. Um, uh, so that that's the the, the uh, that's their bottom line is this is horrible business. Women are do not want to get their hands dirty with this basically horrible stuff. So it, 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 what I always say about Chesterton, this applies to Bella as well, uh, is that you, you, their, their problem, if they have one, is they put women on a pedestal. Um, and perhaps women shouldn't be on a pedestal and perhaps women don't want to be on a pedestal. Right. And that's that's a good issue. But what they don't do is look down upon them from some sort of elitist, uh, male chauvinist uh, perspective. On the contrary, they're old fashioned, uh, medieval, chivalrous uh, men folk who believe that women should be treated with, with due deference and decorum. And if you like, the, 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 the way that we treat the Blessed Virgin is the archetype for the way that we should treat all women. So, um, and, and that, that, the very thought, if, you, if that's your view of women, the very thought that they should be involved in politics would fill you with horror. And I, I think that's that that's the rationale behind it. Now, we don't have to agree with that. Uh, and I say we don't have to agree that that, that, that the women should be on a pedestal. Perhaps they, they certainly if they don't want to be there, you can't force them to be there. And no one's suggesting that, I don't think. Um, but that's the rationale behind it. And I think that rationale is is at least rational. Mm-hmm. Did they ever comment either Belloc or Chesterton on what happened when women did get involved in politics? No, that's actually that's actually a good point. Uh, my, my, the, 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 most of the writing by Chesterton and Belloc on it that I know was in Chesterton's book "What's Wrong with the World," which was published before female suffrage. Uh, and I'm not particularly aware of anything they wrote after the event. So uh, that doesn't mean they didn't. I just don't know. So uh, that's a, that's a very good question to which I don't know the answer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't matter. Um... So I guess one one thing you know to bring in you know there's as you say there's been a Chesterton revival it's still ongoing and from that it's following this Belloc revival and it's you know it's sort of a cliche question I guess in a way but what where, what do you think we can use specifically from Belloc um, I guess you know not necessarily as Catholics but as Christians definitely to sort of help help us uh, get through the modern world because a lot's changed a lot perhaps not so much it's changed it's just intensified right the same thing turned up to eleven. Well, uh, the first thing I would say, and I, uh, that I think that we uh, need to see. Okay, so from a Christian perspective, we need to keep our eye on the finishing line. Uh, in, in other, in other words, that the ultimate reality is with reality himself, uh, and I- I- if we get to heaven, we become the, the fully real human persons we're meant to be. As, as C.S. Lewis says, this is the shadow lands. Um, that the, the, the fullness of reality is, is in the presence of God. This is that there's a shadow that's, that, that, that falls across time and space, which is where we find ourselves. So um, that that being said, um, for me, uh, the fact that Belloc and Chesterton defend Christianity is the most important thing about them. Uh, you know, there are subgroups within that, such as their understanding of politics and economics is a, is a derivative. Of the fact that they're Christians. In other words, these things aren't separate. Their understanding of history is a derivative of the fact that they're Christians. And for me, for Belloc, you know, if I could only take one Belloc book with me on, a, on the proverbial <laughs> desert island, it would be his collected poetry. In other words, you know, that we do have to uh, understand Belloc as someone capable of seeing, perceiving, and then recreating artistically uh, great beauty. And, you know, Dostoevsky, of course, famously said beauty will save the world. But 
but, but let, get, if I just go off on a very quick tangent, mm-hmm. try to do this in one minute, because uh, <laughs> I know you've got a lot of philosophically minded people that that that, that uh, are part of what you you do. That for me, that the the the, the Greek sand, transcendentals, the good, the true, and the beautiful, are triune. They're inseparable, and I think even the Greeks, uh, Plato, Aristotle, had some concept of that. So the good, the true, and the beautiful cannot be separated. I think when Jesus Christ says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." He is saying, I am the good, the true, and the beautiful. So the way of goodness, the truth of logos, ratio, reason, and then beauty is the life. Because what, what beauty is, is the life in something that's perceived by one who's alive. Um, so the beauty is, 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 is in the thing beheld, not in the eye of the beholder, but if the beholder is blind, the beauty won't be beheld. So there's, 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 there's a life that, that, that's necessary for, 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 for beauty. And, and the, another aspect of beauty is the fact that we are made uh, in the Imago Dei. Uh, we are Imago Dei, and the imagination is that Imago Dei in us, the imagination. So we are meant to create. As Tolkien says, we, we make by the law by which we're made. So this whole our, our, our aspect that we are meant to be creative, we're meant to be poets, we're meant to be artists, um, and Belloc is a great poet. And, and, and I, I think if we're only, only seeing him as an historian or as a political thinker or someone who gets in arguments with people, um, then we're not actually seeing the man in his depths, de profundis. We're only actually seeing uh, those, those things that are derived from, that, from those depths. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So perhaps if you were to recommend people books or places to start with Belloc, it would be maybe a mixture of perhaps a servile state and also a book of poetry. Yeah, I mean, what I always say, the difficult thing uh, is that you need to know some something about the person asking the question before you can mm. answer it. So, you know, if, if someone's interested in history or politics or poetry or, or, or literature or, or what have you, religion, um, I, I actually do say, this is the way I answer the question. People say, where shall I start with Chesterton? I actually say, you could start with my book. <laughs> um, uh, and I think it's true of, 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 of Belloc because it, what you need to do is to get to know the man uh, and the various, various facets and aspects of the man. And when you understand the man, then you can see what aspects about him are most attractive to you and, and begin your engagement with, with the writings accordingly. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't it. That was, by the way, a cheap. A cheap no, no, no. I think I think it's a great answer because I, I, I would completely agree. After reading your book, you realise there is. And you know how how many books was it he wrote, Belloc? A good question. I don't know, but well over hundred. Yeah, anyway. well over hundred. So it's it's not like it's a, a question between ten or twenty books. This is you know there's a lot of scope there, and that leads to a you know a very important question: Where can we find your book and your work? Where's the best place to to buy it? Well. Yeah. And in, in, in order to practice my distributive principles, I'm not going to say Amazon, although I just did. <laughs> but, I, but I am going to say don't go to Amazon. Again, I think that, uh, I know this is true of Ignatius Press. My biography of Belloc is published by Tan Books. So tanbooks.com will get them directly to the publisher. Uh, and I think, certainly in case of Ignatius Press, uh, but I, Gracewing, I think, distribute many of the American Catholic publishers in the UK. So... If they go to Grace Ring, they, they can go, but don't go to Amazon if you can avoid it. Okay. Well, I'll look up those uh, those links and be sure to put them in the description below. Um, yeah, Joseph Piss, this has been a great little, uh, you know, intro to the life and work of Belloc. So thank you very much. Oh, it's been a joy. Thanks for having me. Keep up the good work you're doing.